Okay, well, hi, happy Wednesday, hello. Slight technical hiccup, but hopefully fixed now. How was the uh, birthday party on Friday? Was a good time had by all? Full of children. Well, I guess it was kind of supposed to be that. Um, so yeah. Hey, look at this. Look, we got a chat on the video. Thanks to the hard work by Farmos. They were loud, but it was fun, and you had free pizza. Yeah, we're gonna have pizza for dinner ourselves tonight. We've been, uh, hard at work. Packing and cleaning and whatever. We've got a real estate agent coming tomorrow to take a look at our place and see what we can do to make it more appealing for the market um, before we list. Um, make sure my phone volume is turned off. Uh, yeah, so we've been busy with that. Um, oh yeah, yeah, the, the wallow stuff behind me is gonna have to get adjusted. But yeah, We've got chat, so... Shark, you say it's been nearly four years since your last move, which is a weird realization because before that you moved often. Ah, uh, yeah. We've been here for three years, I think. Roughly. Probably a little over three, actually. It's probably like three and a half. Pharma says almost four. Yeah, I guess it's probably closer to four than three. Um, yeah, we've been here for a bit, but, um, yeah, there's just some things that we'd like better where we're living, so, um, and partly that's going to be location. Yeah. So yeah, chat is here, you can see it, hopefully, I don't know if there's a better text color that, that I could pick to uh, have it show up in the video. The intention is so that if, um, if anyone's catching up on YouTube, um, then they can see, you know, what everybody's saying without me having to read everything out loud, which I'm quite used to at this point, so I might need to, that might take some adjustment. Maybe if I, oh, it's not gonna work, is it? Like that, maybe? Just trying to move it over a little. Um, yeah. Means you have to slightly more be- uh, Yeah, as if there's any problems with anyone's behavior. It does mean that if anyone comes in trolling, that'll show up in the video. Um. But, you know, whatever. Maybe I made that a little crowded. Books, brews, and booze! Oh, you got an ad for the first time, too. I'm gonna need to check that, because I haven't done anything for, um, the controls on the ads. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I particularly want... Oh, hey, look at that. Apparently I'm now live. <laughs> I don't particularly want ads playing. Um... So, maybe I'll see if there's a way for me to go in and be gone with those, because I don't know how that works for how often they're going to come up. But that'll have to be after I'm done for today. Um, yeah. So I didn't really actually do any reading on, um... Ah! Prime subscription! Congratulations, Books, Brews, and Booze. You are my very first subscriber. <laughs> Hooray! Oh, that means you get a fancy badge too, doesn't it? Yeah, there it is. Got you a founder badge. I can see it already. Shiny. <laughs> uh... Yeah, I guess the Sharkies, I don't know if you use Twitch 
at all besides coming to do the stuff here, but if you have an Amazon Prime subscription base or yeah, if you are if you have Amazon Prime, you get one like free subscription that you can use on Twitch. Um that I don't know, gets you like badges and things. Look at that little crown right there. Ah, no prime. Yeah, I was using mine for a fr another friend that was um, doing some streaming, but he hasn't been doing that very much recently, so I think my Prime subscription is sitting idle. Yeah, and so technically now we could set, like, custom emotes if anybody... I don't know, I think we need to make, like, a... Maybe an eagle emote and a fork emote and so that people can combo those together. <laughs> And now you can use, you should be getting getting channel points. So just underneath the chat. <laughs> Looks person who is super happy the Froomey has Prime because you wouldn't get it on your own. Oh yeah, we need a, we need a Hank. Oh yeah, and we're going to need a Binibic. Going to need to turn his face into an emote. I'm going to need a Hank emote. Unfortunately, I don't have any artistic skills, but maybe I can commission someone to make some emotes for me. Um, yeah, I think I could probably do that. <laughs> and a teen angst. We're just going over all the um, things that we wanted a button for before. Look at that kitty. Toothless. Oh, yeah, and Grim. <laughs> yeah, every time the word Grim comes up in a book, the chat's just going to get flooded with Grim, 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 Grim. Or Bard. Yeah, every time the word Grim comes up, the chat gets flooded with Bard. Yeah, so there's definitely some more fun things that we can do. And yeah, like I was about to say, just below the chat... I guess it's technically over this way, um, where you would type in your message. Um, there will be a thing for, like, channel points, and you collect those, and then you can use those to do some things. Highlight your message. Um, do Like, you can modify some of the emotes, so if we had a Binibic emote, then you could put some sunglasses on them or something like that. So those are kind of fun, and then every now and then you'll get a little, like, purse-looking or a bag or something that pops up there. That if you tap on that, you'll get some free points. And then I think you get more points just for hanging out and talking in the chat. So that's cool. And then I'm not sure what else is, uh, is new. What else we can do as with the whole affiliate status. Um, but, I don't know, we'll, I'll figure that out as we go. But yeah, if, uh, if anybody wants to try their hand at making some custom emotes, um, I'd be happy to take a look at those, and if not, like, either way, I'm sure I could find a friend, an artistic friend, to, uh, commission. So that'll be fun. So yeah, um... We did a little bit of voting on Friday for what to read next. Um, so far, chances are pretty good. We're going to move on to A Magician's Gambit by David Eddings. Ooh. Now for BBAB, um, before you joined us here, we have read two of these books. It's a, it's a five-part series, so this is like, you know, the third book out of five. And then technically there's another five books that come after, um, but, you know, those are sort of a sec second series. They just, they follow up where this one... Because I carry you. Know, yeah, yeah, it really does. Um, how do you say that last name? You know, that's one of those ones I don't think I've heard out loud. I've seen it written many times. But yes, definitely looks like uh, Dread Pirate Roberts. 
As you wish. Sharky's edition is from 1985. You were thinking you'd catch up, but you honestly forgot with all the work and kitty care. Yeah. Hmm. Hope Kitty's doing okay. Ben had a vet appointment today. Nothing. It was a just a scheduled appointment for getting some vaccines updated, but he does not like the vet, and he recognizes when we're driving there, Elwes. Um, it is the only place I have ever encountered where he will consistently not want to leave the car when we get there. Like, I have to actually pick him up and bring him out of the vehicle because he does not want to get out because he knows where we are. Um... Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That... Um... Yeah. I... Uh, losing a pet is awful. I've been through that, you know. I've had pets my whole life, but... Which is great. You know, it is lovely. Um, and for me, kind of, you know, necessary to have pets, but they become family, and, uh, and, you know, they don't get to stick around as long as we do, and so that means that eventually you need to say goodbye, which is, uh, an awful time. But... I am certain that, you know, Precious knew that you loved her very much and had a better life for having you in it. So. I don't know, that's what I try to remember when going through that kind of thing is that, you know, your furry family was better for being a part of your life, right? Hmm. Well, I'm very sorry for it being that day. What do you think about starting a new book with me today? Um, you would be coming in halfway through. Um, so there's going to be some spoilers. Most of them, I would say, are pretty well broadcast. I don't think we've come across too many really big surprises. There have been one or two. Um, so, I'm not sure. I don't know. What do you think? Should we try and give everybody like a little recap of the past two books alternately we could read something else today and if you want to catch up on the um, previous books then that would give you a little bit of time to do so we could I don't know spend I could try and find something temporary for the next few days All right, very basic cliff notes. Let's see. So, the first book, why don't I grab the previous two? I just got them over here. Uh, here they are. Here's the first one. It's a pawn of prophecy. So for anybody else that might be starting this video, you know, obviously I'm jumping into spoilers here, that's the whole point. Uh, 
do they have the Dread Pirate Roberts? Well, this book started, oh, 15 or so years before where we are now. And so that's um, uh, after some time has passed right over here. That's our boy Dread Pirate Roberts right there. His name is actually Garion. G-A-R-I-O-N. And um, this book started when he was a wee lad uh, growing up on a farm in Sandaria. Faldor's farm, the Goodman Faldor. Um, and oh, when we started out, he was just basically a toddler uh, growing up in the kitchen. And that's his Aunt Pole that he's standing with there. Um, so, probably a solid, like, third at least of the book, of the first book, was Garion's youth, growing up on Faldor's farm, um, in and around the kitchen. Um, partway through, a storyteller showed up. Didn't really have a name, but this storyteller would show up from time to time over the years, and was always welcomed at the table. Um, had a lot of fun stealing <laughs> from Aunt Paul's kitchen, even um, because Aunt Paul ran the kitchen at Faldor's farm. Uh, even when, you know, food was offered to him, he would politely decline, and then as soon as her back was turned, steal it. Uh, and then he would tell stories, and, you know, be fed, and Garion kind of became friends with him. They took a uh, trip to another town together just to fetch some supplies once or twice. Um, Aunt Paul called him Old Wolf, and uh, Garion eventually asked if he could call him Mr. Wolf. So that's how he came to be called. Um, yeah, and then, uh, oh, 60 or so pages in, this guy showed up to work on the farm named Brill. Uh, Brill had kind of a, a bit of a lazy eye and a sour smell and wasn't very likable. And Garion spied Brill who himself was spying on Mr. Wolf and Aunt Pole, having a talk with each other. So he, uh... <laughs> Pharma says, Brill, boo hiss. Garion let them know, um, and he and Mr. Wolf went and confronted Brill, who kind of attacked them, and the smith of Faldor's farm, Dernick, thumped him over the head, thumped Brill over the head, and they, uh, decided they needed to flee the farm for some reason. Um, so, Dernick declared that he was going with them, because Dernick is, uh, you know, very protective of Garion and Aunt Pole. And so the four of them let Faldor know they were leaving and departed. Um... That's basically how it went. So that is the first, oh, 80 pages of the book or so. As they were fleeing the farm, they met up with some people that Garion was a little afraid of at first, but there was a, uh, a weaselly little man named Silk, and a big giant of a man with a great be red beard, um, with braids, I think braids in his beard, um, named Barak. Uh, Barak is kind of, you know, picture your typical Norseman, Dane. <laughs> um, so that's those two. And they, uh, they sort of all started traveling together. And it kind of became hinted at that they were following something. They were trying to find something. Um, Mr. Wolf was trying to find something, and it was important that they track it down. So they did some traveling together, 
Um, and they found that Brill was finding them once or twice, and they got ambushed. Uh, there are a few different... This, this world is divided up into nations. Um, so there's... Let's see, the Alorns are a group of people. Let's see. Let's start way further back. There's a bunch of gods. Seven of them, something like that. And the gods joined hands, created this world. And then they all kind of took groups of men and uh, that sort of followed those gods. And those men all sort of formed nations. And the men also kind of took after their gods, so you get different nations that have different characteristics. Uh, the Alorns um, were sort of one group that got divided up later on because there was this orb uh, created by the god Aldor that caused some division between the other uh, Aldor's brother Torak and the rest of the gods because Torak was jealous of this orb, wanted to steal it, did steal it. Um, so Balar, who was god of the Alorns, divided up his people into the Cheriks, the Drasnians, the Sen... No, the Sendars weren't part of them. The Cheriks, the Drasnians, uh, and the Ravens. Is there one other? Oh, and the, um, Algarians. This isn't important to remember all of this, but you'll hear these names and words come up as we go on. Um, so the Cheriks... Uh, Barak is a Cherik, um, and they're, they live up in the north, and they're huge and burly, and go, you know, they kind of control the oceans with their ships. Um, the Drasnians are known for their spies, <laughs> um, and, uh, surprise, surprise, Silk is a Drasnian. Um... The Ravens live off on an island called the Isle of Winds, and they live there because they were kind of sent separate to protect the Orb of Aldor. Um, so they've got a fortress on this Isle of the Winds, and uh, people don't seem to know that much about them. They wear grey, and these days they're led by a man named Brand. Um, and when one Brand dies, the new person to lead them is also named Brand. It's almost, it's like a title and a name. Um, and the Algarians are nomadic uh, horse people. When I say horse people, I mean they, they ride horses and they, they revere horses and um, they, yeah, horses are very important to their culture. They have one really big stronghold that is almost more like a distraction because there's these Angrax. The Angrax are the people who follow Torak, and they're divided up into a bunch of different tribes. Um, but uh, they tend to be pretty villainous. So you've got Murgos and Thals and Nadrax um, and Grolims, and the Grolims are sort of like, they're almost like a tribe of sorceress priests that sacrifice people to their god, and yeah, they're all kind of nasty. Um, yeah, I, I am throwing out a lot of words here, but I think it's kind of, we need to sort of cover it. Um, anyways, sticking to the story, uh, they traveled for a while, um, and then they got tracked down by the king of Sandaria. Sandaria is the nation, mostly farmers, um, where Faldor's farm is. Uh, so they were tracking, they were trying to follow something, but they got tracked down by the soldiers of the king of Sandaria, King Fulrak of Sandaria, and they got basically marched to the capital, Sendar, to see the king. Garion had no idea why. And Mr. Wolf and Aunt Pole really didn't want to deal with King Fulrax distracting them. Um, and they really didn't seem to have much respect for the king, for his title as king. And it came out in the court of King Fulrax that 
Mr. Wolf is in fact Belgarath the Sorcerer, the Eternal Man, and he's about 7,000 plus years old. And Aunt Pole, Garion's only family he's ever known, uh, is actually his daughter, um, Belgarath's daughter, Polgara the Sorceress. You know, probably four or five thousand years old, something like that. Which kind of explains why they didn't have much time for the kings distracting them. And this kind of threw Garion for a loop. Um, he felt kind of cut adrift, because clearly she couldn't actually be his aunt. And she also started being kind of cold when this information came out. Um, so, the king of Sindaria tracked them down because all of the kings wanted to know what was going on, basically. Um, and I believe at this point they headed off by ship to Cherek. Um, in the frozen north. Where it turned out that Barak is actually an earl, the Earl of Trelheim. And, uh, at some point it also came out that our friend Silk is actually, uh, Prince Keldar of Drasnia. Not, um, not something, more of a cousin to the king, I believe. So, here's a bunch of spoilers for you, but they're going to come out as we're reading anyways. Why did she stop start being cold to him? I think she was trying to show other people that Garion was unimportant, that they didn't need to worry about him, he was just some boy. He was not an important person to be concerned with. So it was, I think, um, less about her wanting to treat him badly and more about her wanting to put on appearances for others that may be watching. Um, yeah, so they went to Cherik to see a council of the kings to let them know what's going on so that they could stop sending troops to interfere with Belgrath and Polgara. So they headed off to Cherik because the kings were gathering there, the kings of a variety of nations, mostly the Alorn nations, I think. Um... Yeah, let's see. So, among the Alorn kings, we had, let's see, King, more of a clan chief Chohag of the Algars. Um, we had the Cherik king's name is Anheg, and Rodar is the king of Drasnia, and then Brand, the Raven Warder. Um, so we met some kings and queens, and while he was in Cherik, uh, Garion went and hunted some wild boars with some of, uh, uh, King Anheg's men. Kind of got roughed up in the meantime, and during all this, he sort of stumbled onto a plot to, uh, of someone that was trying to take over Cherik. Um, an, an Earl of Yarvik who had been exiled previously for um, working with Murgos. Uh, any Angarak, any of the Murgos, the Thals, the Nadraks, none of them are allowed in Cherik on pain of death. So this Earl of Yarvik was taking gold. Uh, we hear frequently about the, r the red gold of the Murgos. It, it's a gold that has a reddish color like blood. And it seems to, once you have some of this Murgo gold, you want more. And the Murgos know this, and they are quite liberal with using it. And so it's sort of a, you know, you, you get some, and you're happy, and you take it home, and you polish it, and you look at it, and, and you think, there's not very much of it, is there? 
I could use a little bit more, and then a Murgo offers you some more, maybe in exchange for some inform information or something like that. And it's something harmless, you know, what harm could it do? So you take the gold and you provide a little more information, and then later on you go, ah, there's still not that much gold. Maybe I could use a little more. And uh, so that's what happened with the Earl of Yarvik. So there was a big battle in the capital of Cherik between the Earl's men and uh, the kings. And um, this rebellion got put down and the Earl of Yarvik was put to death. Also put down. Um, yeah, and that's basically the sum up of Pana Prophecy. There's lots of details, lots of information. Um, one thing I really like about this book is how well it establishes its characters. So I do thoroughly recommend either reading it or going and catching up on YouTube. Because um, it is a fun book. Uh, the next book, Queen of Sorcery. Um, so, this book started off with uh, they had traveled from Cherik after the rebellion was quashed there um, down into Arendia. Arendia is a nation that was somewhat divided by civil war. There were three factions of Arendians. There were the Wasite Arends, but they died out like 700 years ago. Aunt Paul, Bulgara the Sorceress, lived with them for a time, and she misses them dearly. Um, she was very sad about them coming to an end, and she's a bit bitter and upset with her father because he kind of stopped her from interfering in uh, that event when it happened. Um, he was saying that they shouldn't really meddle with that kind of information, and it would have happened inevitably anyways. The you know most she could have done was delay it. Um, there are the Mimbrate Arends. So for them, think of your typical, like, Arthurian knights in shining armor. They're very preoccupied with honor. Um, they ride on armor-clad uh, war horses with lances and charge their enemies head-on, and they'll never turn down a duel. They're that type of people. And then there are the, um, I always forget, let's see, we got Mandor, the Wasite, no, I already mentioned the Wasites. What's the third faction? Let's see. Because we met, in chapter one, our friend Leldoran. Farmer says that the Mimbrates are like the classic lawful stupid paladins of third edition D&D. Asturian. The Asturian Arends, who are sort of more like your Robin Hood types. They're known for their archery. Um, and the Mimbrates are sort of more in control of Arendia and the Wasites or the I just said it the Asturians the Asturians um, don't get as much respect even the sort of noble houses of the Asturians don't get much respect from the Mimbrates um, and so They were in the ruins of Vo Wasun, once home of the Wasite Arends, uh, waiting to meet up with this young Asturian Arend, the finest archer in all the land, and also only like 15 or 16 years old, uh, 18, 18 years old, young Leldoran of Wildantor, who uh, you'll see the Sharkies and Farmos refer to as Lil Doran. <laughs> Books person who says we can forgive a lot of things because 80s. 
even for that, there... Some of the worst tropes of, like, fantasy novels, I feel like, get sidestepped in these books. Some of. There's still some of it there, for sure. Uh, so Leldoran was tied up, it turns out, as he eagerly confided in with Darien. Leldoran is not necessarily the brightest. Uh, Arendians in general, all, well, I guess both Mimbrate and Asturians, are not known for their intelligence, necessarily. They are known for bravery, courage, um, and maybe being a little emotional at times. Not necessarily for their intelligence. Uh, so, Leldorn and Garion became fast friends, even though Garion didn't necessarily like him immediately upon meeting him, but they very quickly became friends. Uh, but it turned out that Leldorin was tied up in um, a scheme to assassinate the Mimbrate King. It seemed very familiar to Garion. Um, another scheme to assassinate a Mimbrate King, and it turned out, eventually, that this scheme was once again funded by Murgo Gold. Um, Garion was not comfortable revealing this plan on his own because he was confided in, so he was trying to encourage Leldorin to tell Belgrath and Otpol about it. Um, yeah, so we met some of Leldorin's extended family. And then, as they were traveling, uh, they were attacked, the whole group was attacked by a pack of Algroths, which are sort of like trolls. They have poisonous claws. They run along, hunched over, kind of. They're quite dangerous. Um, so, our group found a hill to defend themselves on, and they were trying to fight off these Algroths. Um... Laldoran got clawed by one of them, and then they were joined by, um, I'm gonna mess his name up if I don't look at it, it's Mandoralin. Mandoralin. This came first. Mandoralin. Uh, Mandoralin is a membrate knight. Full plate, riding a horse with a lance. Um, and is known as the bravest and mightiest knight in all the land. Um, just, you know, fantastic fighter. Uh, so he came in, drove up all the Algroths, but poor Laldorn was not doing well. Aunt Pol is quite good with medicine, uh, so she did her best um, to abate the poison's course, but... Leldorn was not going to be able to continue traveling with them in the state he was in, not and recover. Um, so he got left with, uh, I believe he got left with some Mimbrate knights in the care of a young woman um, who was somewhat versed in medicine. Mandoralin was quite cold in convincing him to leave, basically telling Leldorn that he was going to hold the rest of them back, that he would drag them down and... Um, they would all be worse for having them with, having him with them. This did not go over well with Garion. Uh, Garion was quite pissed off at Mandoralin and eventually confronted him about it, and said, "You know, why did you treat him like that? Why are you such a jerk?" Um, to which Mandoralin replied, "Ah, yes, that um, the Lady Pulgara." told me that if I did not treat him so, if he was not told in such a fashion, then he would force himself to come with us and would probably die in the process. Um, because he's, you know, very brave and would not be willing to stay behind. Uh, no, I believe that it was Polgara that had a conversation with Mandarellen about Leldorin's condition. Um, yeah, so Garion learned a little bit about Mandarellen at that point, and they traveled to 
Vomandor, uh, capital of Arendia. Um, to have a talk with it was briefly mentioned like he basically just said that um, not necessarily that Aunt Paul told him what to say but that somebody was going to have to convince Leldorn to stay behind and that kindness wouldn't do the trick um so, the king and queen of Arendia are Corodulin and Maya Serena. And they're always Corodulin and Maya Serena because initially, after a civil war some time ago, uh, the Mimbrate Corodulin, or maybe it's the other way around. No, the Mimbrate Corodulin and the um, Asturian Maya Serena were wed together to try and unite the nation. It didn't necessarily work too well. And uh, they suffer a little bit from inbreeding. <laughs> a little bit. But they're still very noble. Anyways, before they departed from Laldoran, Laldoran gave Garion permission to out the scheme of the um, Murgos. He, but he wanted Garion to go straight to the king with this information. While they were in the Mimbrate court, well, on their way there, actually, in order to get let in in the first place, you know, Mandarellen proclaimed that Here's Belgarath, the Eternal Sorcerer, and there was some other knight that was trying to make Mandaral and look bad. That said, that can't be Belgarath. So Belgarath took a twig that was stuck in his horse's mane and said, you know, you don't have much faith, I'm going to restore it for you. And he stuck it in the flagstones in the courtyard in front of the gates, and he grew it into a tree right in front of everyone's faces. Oh, looks like it's going to be an apple tree. And he charged the knight that was doubting them with caring for the apple tree and giving the fruit from it to anyone that might ask for it. Um, and then they went in to uh, see the king and queen. And while they were in that court, they encountered a Murgo ambassador because the Murgos are technically allowed. You know, they're not allowed in Cherik, but other nations they are. They frequently show up as traders and such, right? Uh, the Murgo ambassador, um, Garion, kind of called out the scheme. And while he was doing this, he felt a sort of parallelism to what had happened in Cherek. Like, here we are again, Murgos plotting to assassinate a uh, Alorn king. I guess, the, are the Membrates? No, the Membrates aren't Alorns, but a western king. I uh, guess the Murgos live in the east. Um and Garion poised to out the scheme. Uh, Garion was not oblivious to the fact that this seemed weirdly familiar. Um, the uh, Mandarellen took Garion at his word and challenged the Murgo, and there was a fight in the throne room. Um, and yeah, that sort of wrapped that up. Right. Um, so from there, they traveled south to Tolnedra, Imperial Tolnedra. Um, and while they were entering Tolnedra, they're passing through this village. <laughs> yes, Garion also got hit on by a noble Mimbrate lady who is apparently notorious for husband hunting. Because I believe at this point we have learned that... Was that at the end of Pawn of Prophecy? Let me just check that. It was. It was at the end of Pawn of Prophecy. Um, Garion was feeling very sad, right? Because Aunt Pole was treating him coldly. Um, and he felt like, you know, obviously she's not actually his Aunt Pole. He doesn't have any family. So he was feeling kind of adrift in the world. And um, Mr. Wolf, a.k.a. Belgarath, came and asked him eventually, you know, what's up? They were having a, they were on a ship at the time. 
Why are you acting like this? Why are you all mopey and sad? And Gary Ann said, well, Aunt Pole's not really my Aunt Pole. And he goes, well, she kind of is. It's just, you know, we've been looking after your family for a very, very long time, but technically we are, you know, she, she is related. Like, it's just generations and generations and generations removed. And Gary Ann goes, so we're, we are actually family? She and I are actually family? And Bel Belgrath goes, well, yeah. It's just, there's a lot of great, great, greats in between. Just don't tell her that. And then Garion goes, so she is actually sort of my aunt. And you're her dad. So doesn't that make you kind of my grandfather? And Belgrath goes, huh. I didn't really think about it that way, but yeah, I guess it does. How about that? And they had a little hug, and Gary started to feel a little better after that. Um, so, uh, while they were in their, on their way into Tolnidra, um, this crazed monk from the monastery at Mar Terin came running towards the party, and, uh, kind of ran at Gary and who sort of tried to push him away and he fell over as if he'd been struck even though he hadn't really been and Aunt Paul said you know Gary and you need to go apologize to the the kind man who you pushed over you know put your hand on his head tell him he's gonna feel better and, and say you're sorry so Gary and did that and he felt kind of a rushing sound and then the monk got up and he was totally fine and went on his way and Everyone was like, that's sort of weird, and Aunt Pole said, well, I had to heal him. It's just that the healing had to come from the same hand that dealt the blow in the first place. Aunt Pole has done some magic as well in the past. She cured a blind woman, but removed her sorceress vision in the process, things like that. Um, while they were in Tolnidra, they went to see the Emperor. I think it also came out at some point in here that what they had been following this whole time, what Belgarath and, and Polgara had been chasing, was the Orb of Aldor. Somehow it had been stolen from the Hall of the Raven King on uh, the Isle of Winds. Um, even though it shouldn't have been possible for it to be stolen. Um, because nobody but the uh, noble house of Riva... Um, nobody but the Reven King should be capable of touching the Orb of Aldor without being destroyed. So nobody really knew how it was that it had been stolen, but it had been stolen by Zedar, the apostate, uh, who was once a follower of Aldor, just like Belgarath and Aunt Pol, Polgara, are followers of Aldor. Aldor doesn't have very many disciples, the god Aldor, but those that he does take seem to be those with sorceress talent. So Zedar was once one of these. Um, but broke away to follow Torak for some reason a long time ago. So somehow Zedar stole the Orb of Aldor, which Torak covets above all else. Torak has been defeated several times and is currently locked in sleep and apparently will sleep until the Reven King returns, which is supposedly never, because the, ho the, the whole family of the Reven King were killed thousands of years ago by um, Nyssens, Nyssen assassins. Boy, I'm really going on, huh? We're almost an hour in, and I'm still going on for recap stuff. <laughs> I know this is a lot of words, but... Um, it's also been a little while since we've read these books, so I think it's going to be good for everybody to have a little recap, right? Um, so, they're following the Orb of Aldor, they're following Zedar, and um, they go to let the Emperor of Tolnidra know what's going on. Um, Tolnidra does not necessarily get along super well with all of the, the other nations. They, the Tolnidrans are known for their um, treaties. They uh, they like they love to sign treaties and they love to get as much of an advantage out of said treaties as they can. You can earn a lot of channel points while I recap. 
Sharky say Tolnidra is kind of like the Roman Empire. Um, yes, they they have they build highways, and uh, they are good at building highways. And they put hostels along the highways for people to stand uh, to stay in when they need to. And they police these highways with their imperial troops, which are a lot like the Roman legions. Um, and so they build these highways through other kingdoms, and they have treaties that these highways are Tolnidran land. Um, but they're well maintained, and they're good for business, right? Merchants love good roads. Um... <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so they met the emperor who ended up sounding a lot like Wallace Shawn, it turns out. <laughs> and they met the emperor's daughter, the uh, imperial princess Senedra, a um, fiery-headed young girl. Sharky say Tolnidrans also have laws a lot like Hank Morkork. Not to that extreme. <laughs> Um, the Emperor very devoutly did not believe in magic, even uh, as they were kind of showing it to his face. Uh, he, you know, he said, basically, for the sake of argument, let's pretend I believed that you're Belgarath and Polgara, just to move this conversation along. So they basically, they let him know what was going on and that the Murgos were going to be trouble. He was like, no, no, the Murgos are good businessmen. They bring in lots of money. There's no way that that'll be an issue. And they're like, whatever. So they left. And while they were on the road out of there, they were joined by a dark-haired young girl and her tutor who were traveling to see her extended family. Definitely not any imperial princesses here. Or any tutors named Jeebers. And they definitely fooled everybody, especially what the? What's going on? Oh, I just had a little banner ad show up on my side. Yeah, with her servant Jeebers. That's weird. Um, uh, just my stream kind of like shrunk and a little banner showed up underneath. Uh, yeah. So, Garion was not fooled at all. Neither was Polgara. Some of the others might have been. Uh, um, which was a little weird because it really didn't seem like Silk was the type, but maybe he just wasn't paying attention. Uh, so they traveled for a bit, and then eventually Aunt Pol is like, the, the jig is up, we know who you are, um, and you're going to continue traveling with us anyways. And Jeebers was like, Nuts to that, and he took off to try and save his own hide because uh, Princess Sinedra had convinced him that this secret trip um, was at the behest of her father, uh, who was not letting her out of the palace because there. Tolnidra is in a succession crisis. The emperor doesn't have a son. Uh, the princess can't inherit, so the other noble houses are all trying to establish who's going to be the next emperor, uh, and they're doing so with bribes and assassinations. So she decided, since I'm not allowed out of the palace for my own safety, I'm going to sneak out. And she convinced Jeebers that he was supposed to be escorting her out of there, because Jeebers is not the brightest, it turns out. Anyways, he skedaddled. She stuck with them at uh, Polgara's insistence, because if she didn't, then Polgara was going to drag her along in chains. Uh, they visited the forest of the Dryads, because it turns out that Sinedra is part Dryad. Uh, technically, is fully Dryad. Essentially, her father's house, the house of Borun, made a deal with the Dryads a long, long time ago, generations ago, that the Dryads would provide the house with wives, um, in exchange, the House of Barun would protect the forest of the Dryads. No, you know, lumberjacks are allowed in that forest. Um, but the women on the Barun, in the Barun House, always breed true as Dryads. 
Um, there are no male dryads. They uh, accost people for those purposes when, when men are needed. Um, so Sinedra was like, I'll stay here. I'm going to stay with the dryads. And the queen of the dryads was like, no, you're not going to do that. You're going to keep going with Polgar Polgara because she says so. There's also this treaty from a long, long time ago that an imperial princess of Tolnedra will always present herself on her... Pharma says you assume sometimes they just seduce? Maybe. Yes, it was implied that Belgarath has visited the Dryads before. Apparently he gets along quite well with them. Um, anyways, there is a treaty from a long, long time ago that any imperial princess of the Tolnedrans will present herself in her wedding dress to the Hall of the Reven King on her 16th birthday. Even though there is no longer a Reven King, the treaty says they have to do it. Um, so they do it, because if they break the treaty, uh, they're going to be in trouble. And both Sinedra and her father, Ran Barun, were trying to convince Belgrath that this treaty isn't really necessary anymore. Can we just get rid of that old tradition? There isn't a, a Reven King. It's just embarrassing for her to have to do this. And they said, nope, it's gotta, she's got to do it. The treaty is a treaty. No breaking it. So Sinedra really wants to avoid that fate. And Polgar is like, too bad. You're going. And you're coming with us until then. Uh, so, while they were leaving the... Um, forest of the Dryads, they got attacked by these horrible mud golem creatures that were shambling and slimy, and inside their heads were little snakes piloting them. It was gross. Uh, Mandarallan felt fear for the first time in his entire life, and he did not like it. Um, Dernick afterwards told him that, yes, zombogies, right? They were like zombies from the bog. Bog zombies, zombogies. Sharky say, and Sinedra and Garion had awkward, sexy pond bath times. Garion was having a bath in a pond. Sinedra showed up to have a bath in a pond, and it turns out that Tolnadrans don't have much, much compunctions. Is that a word? Anyways, Tolnadrans don't care much about nudity and have shared baths, uh, mixed bathing, and even, you know, public sporting events are performed in the nude. The Romans, like we said before. Um, Garion, however, is a Sendarian, or at least he grew up that way, and he's been told repeatedly he's not actually a Sendarian. Um, Aunt Pole put Sinedra up to it. Well, Aunt Pole told her to go have a, to fetch Garion and also to have a bath herself, to go wash her hair out because of the awful hair dye that she'd used. Anyways. So they were attacked by Zombogies. They weren't called that in the book, that's just what we called them. Mandarallan felt fear. Later, Dernick told him that most people do feel fear quite frequently. It's kind of a common thing. You know, fear of lots of things. Fear of the harvest being bad. Fear of being attacked. Fear of whatever, right? Mandarallan says, well, how do you deal with it? It's awful. I hate it. And Dernick said, well, I don't know. Sometimes I try laughing at it. Um, anyways, the Zombogies were apparently sent by Salmisra, queen of the Nissans. Uh, they worship the snake god Nissa, and they try to take sort of snake-like affectations. The men all shave their heads bald, they all speak with a lisp. Um, and uh, they all live in a swamp, and um, there's lots of drug use and poisons and things like that. Um, also, it was probably around this time... Oh yeah, they have slaves too. It was probably around this time that um, Belgarath and Silk 
split from the group to try and go track the orb separately. Um, they were going to split up for some reason. I don't remember the exact reason they needed to go scout something out. And it was not going to be as effective to travel as a group. And after they took off, the group got ambushed by one of the Tolnidrin noble houses lords and Asherak the Murgo, who has plagued the party for a while. Uh, Asherak the Grolem, technically, uses sorcery. He's come up a few times, I haven't mentioned him, but basically he's been stalking Garion since Garion was a child. Garion has kept having visions of a man on a black horse that casts no shadow that watches him and then departs or vanishes, and Garion has always felt that it was something private that he wasn't allowed to tell anybody about. And it turns out that this is because Ashrak had kind of a hold on Garion's mind and was manipulating Garion to not tell anyone. So Aunt Paul and Belgarath found, about, found out about this back in Cherik, and they gave Garion this amulet that he was to wear at all times after they broke Ashrak's hold on his mind. Um, so Garion took the amulet off at one point to have a bath and realized that he should never take it off. And this hold got put back on his mind. Anyways, Ashrak showed up and declared that Garion was going to get put into chains and Aunt Pole was going to be taken to be Torak's wife. Uh, when Torak woke up, um, because Torak is kind of obsessed with Aunt Pole as well, has decided that they're going to be married. Um, and it was at about this time that Aunt Pole revealed to Garion that Ashrak was the one that had killed Garion's parents. When Garion was a baby, his father was a stone cut cutter, and that his mother and father and he lived in a little stone house, and Ashrak snuck up and sealed up the house and set it on fire despite it being made out of stone. And Garion's father pushed a stone out of the wall and shoved Garion through it um, to Belgarath, I believe, or Belgarath retrieved him. Actually, I think what happened is Zedar snatched up, not Zedar, uh, Ashrak snatched up Garion and fled. Belgarath pursued him and uh, Ashrak, Ashrak escaped by throwing Garion at Belgarath. So, Ashrak was the one that killed Garion's parents. Garion flew into a rage at hearing this. Uh, well, actually, it was more at Ashrak slapping Aunt Paul. I'm slightly mixing this up, but Ashrak slapped Aunt Paul. Garion ran up, struck Ashrak, and said, Burn! And Ashrak burst into flames. And that's when Aunt Paul told him what Ashrak had done in the past in order to keep Garion's rage focused on him until Ashrak burned to death. So, surprise, turns out Garion can do magic, and since then, Aunt Paul has been referring to him as Belgarian, uh, because such is the way that the followers of Aldur name themselves. Belgarath was once Garath. Polgara, I guess, was would have just been Gara, except that she was kind of revealed as a sorceress when she was born. Um, yeah. So, Garion can do magic. And he doesn't like it, because his first encounter, really, with doing it was burning a man to death, so he kind of thought of himself as a monster. Polgara says he needs to be taught, and he goes, nope, I don't want to do it anymore. I'm never doing magic again. So they had a bit of a fight over that. They got a bit heated at times, arguing with each other. Um, anyways, they went to Nyssa. And Garion got kidnapped by the Nyssen Queen. Um, and she kind of drugged him and said he was going to be her consort. And uh, was apparently 
going to trade him to the Murgos in exchange for marriage to Torak, because she wanted to live forever. Um, she was kind of gross. Uh, then Polgara and Barak burst into her palace. Barak was kind of overtaken with a bear spirit and basically transformed into a bear and was mauling people and crunching their heads in his jaws and things like that. And Polgara stormed in and Salmisra the queen summoned the spirit of her god Nyssa. Nyssa was like, what's going on here? And Polgara had a chat with Nyssa and said, your queen's kind of trying to consort with Torak. Um, so Nyssa said, okay, well, deal with her, but just don't kill her, please. So Polgara turned her into a snake and said she'll probably live forever, which is what she wanted. So the snake queen Selmisra sat on her divan with the crown on her head, staring at a mirror, admiring herself, coming to terms with being a snake. And that's the end of Queen of Sorcery. And that's where we're at. <laughs> that's basically it. Um, Sinedra has been teaching Garion to read because he never learned how to read because Polgara doesn't really care about reading. Mr. Wolf does. Polgara doesn't. Um, Belgarath and Silk rejoined the party. Belgarath's arm was in a sling. Apparently a tree fell on him. Silk found this hilarious. So there's your recap of two books worth of information, and now it's quarter after eight. And uh, what do I, what should I, should I, should I start reading Magician's Gambit? Should we get through the prologue? <laughs> we spend most of the time I would normally be reading just recapping the previous two books. Which is all my fault, because it took forever at it. Apparently I'm not very succinct, but it just feels like there's a lot of information that needs to be conveyed. So, oh boy. <laughs> Hopefully this was at least somewhat followable. I still recommend actually reading the books, but, oh boy. Oh yeah, Hetar. Hetar joined the party um, from Cherik. Basically, Hetar is the adopted son of the clan chief Chohag, and he uh, he hates Murgos. Hetar hates Murgos, and he can talk to horses. He can understand them with sort of like a psychic link. Oh boy, I uh. <laughs> I did not intend to spend this much time recapping. It just sort of happened. Um, so what does everybody think? It's now 20 after 8 my time. Um, and it is Wednesday. Should we try and read a prologue and a chapter? The prologues tend to be a little dry. If we wanted to get through one chapter... Where does chapter... Nice thing about these books, they have chapters, but we would need to read 20 pages in order to get through the prologue and a chapter. The prologue itself is... seven pages? Um, yeah, why don't we just do the prologue? Alright, so... These prologues tend to be sort of a cross between a religious and a historic text, like Barmo says. They give some background on the world, usually. Um, so this bit may be a little more dry than the rest of the book will be, just as a warning, but hopefully it's not going to be that bad. Um, just to have a look-see, there are lots of maps in these books. So this is the Kingdoms of the West and the Angarax. And it is not focusing very well. Whatever. Um, if you end up 
finding a copy of the books, then, uh, yeah, usually each part starts with, uh, the books are usually divided up into two or three parts, um, that are somewhat divided by what nation they take place in, country, whatever. Um, and each part usually starts with a map of said area. Um, but yeah, I'm going to start with the prologue. On page one. Magician's Gambit, everybody. Let's get into it. And then we'll actually read a little more on Friday. Hmm, Farmhouse wondering about if we get a good Belgariad map. That would be cool. <clears throat> so, prologue. Being an account of how Gorim sought a god for his people and of how he found Ul upon the sacred mountain of Prolgu, based upon the Book of Ulgo and other fragments. Like I said, a bit of a religious text. <clears throat> At the beginning of days, the world was spun out of darkness by the seven gods, and they also created beasts and fowls, serpents and fishes, and lastly, man. Now, there dwelt in the heavens a spirit known as Ul, who did not join in this creation. And because he withheld his power and wisdom, much that was made was marred and imperfect. Many creatures were unseemly and strange. These the younger gods sought to unmake, so that all upon the world might be fair. But Ul stretched forth his hand and prevented them, saying, What you have wrought you may not unmake. You have torn asunder the fabric and piece of the heavens to bring forth this world as a plaything and an entertainment. Know, however, that whatsoever you make, be it ever so monstrous, shall abide as a rebuke for your folly. In the day that one thing which you have made is unmade, all shall be unmade. So that's an interesting point here, because we've come across this before in the past. Belgarath has told Garion, or maybe Polgara, one of them told Garion, that you can create something with magic, but you cannot tell anything, be not. You cannot unmake anything, and if you try to, your magic will recoil upon you and you'll get destroyed instead. Because if you were to actually unmake something, the whole world would come apart. And so to prevent that from happening, you just can't do it. And now we know why. It's because the god Ul is the one that declared it so. <clears throat> the younger gods were angered. To each monstrous or unseemly thing they had made, they said, Go thou unto Ul, and let him be thy god. Then, from the races of men, each god chose that people which pleased him. And when there were yet peoples who had no god, the younger gods drove them forth and said, Go unto Ul, and he shall be your god. And Ul did not speak. For long and bitter generations, the godless ones wandered and cried out unheard in the wastelands and wilderness of the West. Then there appeared among their numbers a just and righteous man named Gorim. He gathered the multitudes before him and spoke to them. We wither and fall as the leaves from the rigors of our wanderings. Our children and our old men die. Better it is that only one shall die. Therefore, stay here and rest upon this plain. I will search for the god named Ul, so that we may worship him and have a place in this world. For twenty years, Gorim sought Ul, but in vain. Yet the years passed, his hair turned gray, and he wearied of his search. In despair, he went up onto a high mountain and cried in a great voice to the sky, no more! I will search no longer! The gods are a mockery and deception, 
and the world is a barren void. There is no Ull, and I am sick of the curse and affliction of my life. The spirit of Ull heard, and replied, Why art thou wroth with me, Gorim? Thy making and thy casting out were none of my doing. Gorim was afraid, and fell upon his face. And Ull spoke again, saying, Rise, Gorim, for I am not thy god. Gorim did arise, or sorry, Gorim did not arise. O oh my god, he cried, hide not thy face from thy people, who are sorely afflicted because they are outcast and have no god to protect them. Rise, Gorim, Ul repeated, and quit this place. Cease thy complaining. Seek thou a god elsewhere, and leave me in peace. Still, Gorim did not rise. Oh, my god, he said. I will still abide. Thy people hunger and thirst. They seek thy blessing, and a place where they may dwell. Thy speech wearies me, Ul said, and he departed. <clears throat> Gorim remained on the mountain, and the beasts of the field and fowls of the air brought him sustenance. For more than a year he remained. Shucky say, Ul sounds delightful. <laughs> yeah. Piss off, I'm not your god. Leave me alone. Paraphrased from Ul. <clears throat> For more than a year he remained. Then the monstrous and unseemly things which the gods had made came and sat at his feet, watching him. The spirit of Ul was troubled. At last he appeared to Gorim. Abidest thou still? Gorim fell on his face and said, O oh my God, thy people cry unto thee in their affliction. The spirit of Ul fled, but Gorim abode there for another year. Dragons brought him meat, and unicorns gave him water. Dragons and unicorns. How about that? And that's the first we've heard of either of them in this series. And again, Ul came to him, asking, Abidest thou still? Gorim fell on his face. Oh, my God, he cried, thy people perish in the absence of thy care. And Ul fled from the righteous man. Another year passed while nameless, unseen things brought him food and drink. And the spirit of Ul came to the high mountain and ordered, Rise, Gorim. From his prostrate position, Gorim pleaded, O oh my God, have mercy! Rise, Gorim, Ul replied. He reached down and lifted Gorim up with his hands. I am Ul, thy God. I command thee to rise and stand before me. Then wilt, then wilt thou be my God? Gorim asked. And God unto my people? I am thy God, and the God of thy people also, Ul said. Gorim looked down from his high place, and beheld the unseemly creatures which had cared for him in his travail. What of these, O oh my God? Wilt thou be God unto the basilisk and the minotaur, the dragon and the chimera, the unicorn and the thing unnamed, the winged serpent and the thing unseen? For these are also outcast. Yet... There is beauty in each. Turn not your face from them, O my God, for in them is great worthiness. They were sent to thee by the younger gods. Who will be their God if you refuse them? Sharky say, for those keeping track, that's 23 years. The unicorn and uh, that thing. Well, he can't name them. He's not a god. <clears throat> it was done in my despite, 
Ole said. These creatures were sent unto me to bring shame upon me that I had rebuked the younger gods. I will in no wise be god unto monsters. The creatures at Gorham's feet moaned. Gorham seated himself on the earth and said, Yet I will abide, O my God. Abide if it please thee, Ole said, and departed. It was even as before. Gorim abode. The creatures sustained him, and Ole was troubled. And before the holiness of Gorim, the great God repented and came again. Rise, Gorim, and serve thy God. Ul reached down and lifted Gorim. Bring unto me the creatures who sit before thee, and I will consider them. If each hath beauty and worthiness, as thou sayest, then I will consent to be their God also. Then Gorim brought the creatures before Ul. The creatures prostrated themselves before the God and moaned to beseech his blessing. Ul marveled that he had not seen the beauty of each creature before. He raised up his hands and blessed them, saying, I am Ul, and I find beauty and worthiness in each of you. I will be your God, and you shall prosper, and peace shall be among you. Gorham was glad of heart, and he named the high place where all had come to pass Prolgu, which means holy place. Then he departed and returned to the plain to bring his people unto their god. But they did not know him, for the hands of Ul had touched him, and all color had fled, leaving his body and hair as white as new snow. The people feared him and drove him away with stones. Gorim cried unto Ul, O oh my god! Thy touch has changed me, and my people know me not. Ul raised his hand, and the people were made colorless like Gorim. The spirit of Ul spoke to them in a great voice. Hearken unto the words of your God. This is he whom you call Gorim, and he has prevailed upon me to accept you as my people, to watch over you, provide for you, and be God over you. Henceforth you shall be called Ulgo, in remembrance of me and in token of his holiness. You shall do as he commands and go where he leads. Any who fail to obey him or follow him, I will cut off to wither and perish and be no more. <clears throat> a bit Ten Commandments-y? A bit, but also it's an interesting story of like, this is not a all-knowing God, right? Gorham is here, says, please be our God. And he's like, no, I don't want to. And so Gorham, like, convinces him. And then he goes, fine, I will. And he goes, well, what about these monsters? They're good, too. And he goes, no, I don't want to. And he goes, look at them. They're beautiful. And he goes, no, bye. And then Gorham goes, well, okay, and then I'm not going to follow you until you stay and, and check. So that's, I find, an interesting take in this story that, you know, Ul maybe was wrong. <laughs> Ul is the cranky great uncle of the gods who wanted to sulk on his own but actually has a soft spot. A heart of gold. Something like that. <clears throat> Gorim commanded the people to take up their goods and their cattle and follow him to the mountains. But the elders of the people did not believe him, nor that the voice had been the voice of Ul. They spoke to Gorim in despite, saying, If you are, to, are the servant of the god Ul, perform a wonder in proof of it. Prove it then. Gorim answered, Behold your skin and hair. Is that not wonder enough for you? They were troubled and went away. But they came to him again, saying, The mark upon us is because of a pestilence which you brought from some unclean place, and no proof of the favor of Ul. Gorim raised his hands, 
and the creatures which had sustained him came to him like lambs to a shepherd. The elders were afraid and went away for a time. But soon they came again, saying, The creatures are monstrous and unseemly. You are a demon sent to lure the people to destruction, not a servant of the great god Ul. We have still seen no proof of the favor of Ul. Now Gorim grew weary of them. He cried in a great voice, I say to the people that have heard the voice of Ul, I have suffered much in your behalf. Now I return to Prolgu, the holy place. Let him who would follow me do so. Let him who would not remain. He turned and went toward the mountains. Some few people went with him, but the greater part of the people remained, and they reviled Gorim and those who followed him. Where is this wonder which proves the favor of Ul? We do not follow or obey Gorim, yet neither do we will wither and perish. Then Gorim looked upon them in great sadness and spoke to them for the last time. You have besought a wonder from me. Then behold this wonder. Even as the voice of Ul said, you are withered like the limb of a tree that is cut off. Truly, this day you have perished. And he led the, the few who followed him into the mountains and to Prolgu. The multitude of the people mocked him and returned to their tents to laugh at the folly of those who followed him. For a year they laughed and mocked. Then they laughed no more, for their women were barren and bore no children. The people withered, and in time they perished and were no more. The people who had followed Gorim came with him to Prolgu. There they built a city. The spirit of Ul was with them, and they dwelt in peace with the creatures who had sustained Gorim. Gorim lived for many lifetimes, and after him each high priest of Ul was named Gorim and lived to a great age. That's at least three, four, three? That's three now, right? Brand, Corduelan, and Maya Serena, Gorim. Am I forgetting any others? <laughs> <clears throat> Sharky say, who had inherited names on their bingo card? <coughs> Each high priest was of Ul was named Gorim and lived to a great age. For a thousand years, the peace of Ul was with them, and they believed it would last forever. Oh, yeah, Salmisra. Salmisra was one too. That's right. They all have different reasons. Bran is because... The warder of Riven, the warden of Riva, the warden of Riva is not supposed to seek glory for himself. He is just supposed to protect Riva and that's it. And so they're all named Brand so that they can't attach glory to their name. Um, Corridolan and Maya Serena uh, were to try and maintain unity in Arendia. Salmisra was because the original first Salmisra was the beloved of Nyssa, and so each new Salmisra try, is chosen to try and seem as much like the original as possible to maintain the illusion of being um, Nyssa's beloved. And Gorim is out of respect for the first Gorim, basically just a, he was such a great man, we're doing this out of respect. The Emperor of Tolnadra wasn't um, an inherited name. That was Ran Borun, uh, which was the house name of Borun. Ran, I guess, is sort of like a title, kind of like, I guess, like Rex or whatever, Regis, right? So it's sort of a title, but he still had his own name. Oh, I see. Sorry, I misunderstood. Gotcha, gotcha. Anyways... <clears throat> they believed 
that peace would last forever. But the evil god Torak stole the orb that was made by the god Aldor, and the war of men and gods began. Torak used the orb to break the earth asunder and let in the sea, and the orb burned him horribly, and he fled into Maloria. The earth was maddened by her wounding, and the creatures which had dwelt in peace with the people of Ulgo were also maddened by that wounding. They rose against the fellowship of Ul, and cast down the cities, and slew the people, until few remained. Those who escaped fled to Prolgu, where the creatures dared not follow for fear of the wrath of Ul. Loud were the cries and lamentations of the people. Ul was troubled, and he revealed to them the caves that lay under Prolgu. Is that the first time we've heard of the earth as sentient? We've, I mean, in kind of general terms, like we've heard that the earth was wounded before. Maddened? I, I don't think we've heard it in such words necessarily. <clears throat> Ul was troubled and he revealed to them the caves that lay under Prolgu. The people went down into the sacred caves of Ul and dwelt there. In time, Belgarath the sorcerer led the king of the Alorns and his sons into Maloria to steal back the orb. When Torak sought to pursue, the wrath of the orb drove him back. Belgarath gave the orb to the first Reven king, saying that so long as one of his descendants held the orb, the west would be safe. Now the Alorns scattered and pushed southward into new lands, and the peoples of other gods were troubled by the war of gods and men, and fled to seize other lands which they called by strange names. But the people of Ul held to the caverns of Prolgu and had no dealings with them. Ul protected them and hid them, and the strangers did not know that the people were there. For century after century, the people of Ul took no note of the outer world, even when that world was rocked by the assassination of the last Reven king and his family. But when Torak came ravening into the west, leading a mighty army through the lands of the children of Ul, the spirit of Ul spoke with the Gorim, and the Gorim led forth his people in stealth by night. They fell upon the sleeping army and wrecked mighty havoc. Thus the army of Torak was weakened and fell in defeat before the armies of the west at a place called Vomimbre. Then the Gorim girded himself and went forth to hold counsel with the victors, and he brought back word that Torak had been gravely wounded. Though the evil god's body was stolen away and hidden by his disciple Belzadar, I don't know if we've actually seen it written like Belzadar very, maybe once before, maybe. It was said that Torak would lie bound in a sleep like death itself until a descendant of the Raven line should again sit upon the throne at Riva, which meant never, since it was known that no descendants of that line lived. Shocking as the visit of the Gorim to the outer world had been, no harm seemed to come of it. The children of Ul still prospered under the care of their god, and life went on almost as before. It was noticed that the Gorim seemed to spend less time studying the Book of Ulgo and more searching through moldy old scrolls of prophecy. But a certain oddity might be expected of one who had gone forth from the caverns of Ul into the world of other peoples. Then a strange old man appeared before the entrance to the caverns, demanding to speak with the Gorim and such was the power of his voice that the Gorim was summoned. Then, for the first time, 
since the people had sought safety in the caverns. One who was not of the people of Ul was admitted. The Gorim took the stranger into his chambers and remained closeted with him for days. And thereafter, the strange man with the white beard and tattered clothing appeared at long intervals and was welcomed by the Gorim. It was even reported once, by a young boy, that there was a great gray wolf with the Gorim, but that was probably only some dream brought on by sickness, though the boy refused to recant. The people adjusted and accepted the strangeness of their Gorim, and the years passed, and the people gave thanks to their god, knowing that they were the chosen people of the great god Ul. And that brings us to part one, Maragor. Maragor, you may recall, the uh, people of Maragor are dead. They were wiped out, ostensibly for being cannibals, possibly for having a lot of gold. Um... Like you say, three books in, and we're still waiting for someone to ask him the time. <laughs> oh, boy. So those prologues, like I said, they can be a little dry. I do think there's some interesting information in them. And they definitely set things up. Oop, let me try and there we go. Maragor. Looks like it is south of Tolnadra. Um, you can see here we've got over here Mar Terin. Mar Amon is more central. What oh, I hear scrambling. Uh, what else do we have? Some ruins. A monolith. A few monoliths and a gold camp at the southern border, way down here. Uh, let's see, right, right here, gold camp, right over here. It's focused up all right here. Your map is different. Your map is different. What? Send me a picture. I need to see this. Just about to. I kind of, I guessed, but. <laughs> Your map of Maragor is different? Why would the map be different? This is a, fir this is a first, right? I don't think we've had a different map before. Looks like a different artist. That's weird. if like the font is different because the font in this one is the same for me as has been on different map maps oh yeah huh are things in the same place they're not Martarin is in a different place on your map Martyrin is more northern, is north of the river. On mine, Martyrin is south. This is the Sharky's map. Let me... Looks... This... Your version looks uh, more like... Like a Middle Earth map to me. It's not focusing very well, is it? Conspiracy of cartographers. <laughs> Come on. Hmm. Maybe if I bring it way up close and then back it out a little. Nah, it doesn't seem to want to focus, I'm sorry. But yeah, uh, in, the, in the Sharky's map, Martyrin is like up here. In mine, it's down here, like it's south of the river. Theirs is north. Conspiracy of Cartographers is a quote from um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Just a conspiracy of cartographers, then. 
That is Rosenkranz and Gildenstern are dead, right? I'm not misquoting that. Um, Mar Ammon is roughly in the same place, though the rivers branch a little differently. The monoliths are still there. The gold camp on the Sharkies map is more central um, south. Like, there's a still at the southern border, but it's more central, whereas mine, it's further uh, to the east. Other than that, everything else looks like it's roughly in the same place. Also, the River of the Serpent is, is named on the Sharky's map and visible, but it is not on mine. Yeah. I think, so my, whoops, my map with the font and um, the art style definitely matches the previous maps from the previous books. So this is the definitely the style I'm used to. Um, I wonder why. I wonder why they would change the map in a different edition. So you, when did you say your printing was? Scroll way up and see if I can find it. Um, eighty-five. Okay. Um, let's see if I can figure out my printing. Hmm, I think mine's also 85. Mine says printed in Canada. Uh, it says first edition was June 1983, ninth printing November 1985. The overall map. Oh, the this one is the same. Hmm. Um, yeah, mine says printed in Canada, additional maps by, so it says the, um, the front map of the Kingdoms of the West and Angarax by Shelley Shapiro. Yeah, so this map is by Shelley Shapiro, and then the one, no, yeah, the one in here, odd. It says additional maps by Chris Barbieri, but this map is autographed by Shelley Shapiro down in the corner, or, you know, signed, whatever. It says Shelley Shapiro down in the corner of the map. Let's see if yours has a name in it. I wonder if yours is Chris Barbieri or whatever. Oh, yours is! I think. It's hard to tell in the picture, but I think yours says Barb... Bar, it says Barb something in the corner, underneath Cthul Murgos. Yours publishing page says the same as yours, but I'm guessing the second one is the Chris Barbieri... Or Barberi? Is it Barberi? Yeah, you've got a... Hmm. In the inside cover, mine says Barb... Anyways, you've got the Chris map, the Barbieri map, and I've got the Shelley Shapiro map. Wonder why... That's that's unusual. I wonder what the later map. You should not look ahead because you shouldn't see where we're gonna go to. But I'm gonna sneak peek. Yeah, I've got a Shelley Shapiro map later too. Huh? Mine mentions Chris Barbieri. It says additional maps by Chris Barbieri, but doesn't actually have them. <laughs> yeah, mine has. A weird printing inaccuracy despite being from the same year? Well, I'm guessing that the Shelley Shapiro maps must be the original ones. I don't know why they would get replaced. Curious. I love little mysteries like that, but I also kind of hate them because I want to know what happened. <laughs> yeah, I'm super blurry now. I went out of focus trying to bring maps in, into focus. Hey. Ah, oh, well, we're, uh, we're done here for tonight, so it's not too important. So on Friday, we'll actually read chapter one. I promised the style of writing 
should be a little more engaging. Um, I doubt you're going to listen to uh, two books worth of writing between or of of reading between now and then. Um, for books, brews, and boo booze, but books, booze, brews, and booze, b b a b. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but hopefully you find it engaging enough. Thanks for the command. Yeah, well, I'm glad that you're here to spend time with us. It is nice to have you here. And, um, yeah. I am very sorry for your loss. But I hope you're able to get an early night's sleep and heal yourself a little bit. And please, you know, if you can, come back on Friday. I'll read some more and introduce you a little bit more to the actual world of the Belgariad. Um, yeah, I don't have anybody on my list that's, um, streaming right now. So I think I'm just going to wrap things up here. I'm going to go eat some pizza. Maybe. Got two shows now on Disney Plus that are both, I think, updating on Wednesdays. Obi-Wan Kenobi and uh, Ms. Marvel. Uh, there she is. Way, way, way out of focus, but there's the Ms. Marvel poster. So I'm going to go probably watch one of those. But yeah. Um... All right, well, I hope the rest of the week is all right for everybody, because I'm still way out of focus. I'll be here on Friday. I'll let you know then how things go with our real estate agent tomorrow. All right. Good night, everyone. See you Friday, hope. Bye. <laughs>